and be glad in it. <laughs> Here you can have that bit of paper too. Thank you. Okay, well, it's good to be with you again this morning. Um, my presentations during this week are going to be a little varied. What I mean by that is that um, tomorrow morning I will speak on the subject of the Christian coalition, and that's a deep subject, really deep. This morning it's fairly light uh, in, 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 a, in the sense that, um, well, you'll find out as we go along. <laughs> All right. You know, there's a class of little children who uh, were asked to choose a subject and make a drawing of it. I guess you've heard this story before. And the teacher looked over the shoulder of the children as, uh, as they, they made their drawings and, and she stopped and looked over the shoulder of a little girl and she said, tell me, sweetheart, what, what are you drawing? And the little girl said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, well now, that's, that's a bit difficult. I mean, how can you do that? Because nobody knows what God looks like. And the little girl looked up and with a smile and confidence, she said, they will know when I'm finished. <laughs> you see, uh, what is God like? Children have wonderful imaginations and sometimes close to inspira inspiration. They're close to being inspired, aren't they, in the things they say. When my son was just a little boy, we'd stop by the roadside once to watch a beautiful sunset. And it was just so glorious. Brilliant red clouds spread out across the sky and the light shining through with beams of light here and there. And um, the little fellow, I don't know whether it was the first he'd ever seen or, or, or not, but at least um, he was so impressed by it that he, he looked up and his eyes opened wide as he exclaimed, Mummy, look at the glory of God shining through. And I, I think that probably he was much closer to the truth than at first we might have thought. The glory of God shining through. Who's responsible for the beauty of a sunset? But isn't it God? It is God who has uh, placed so many beautiful things in this world. And um, I think that we need to keep that in mind. You know, God said we should become as little children so that we might receive the simplest lessons of faith and trust. And I have spent a lot of time with little children through the years and and have uh, appreciated the way they see things. You know, some years later, when my son, who, who was so enamored by that sunset, had grown up more, and he and I were on a holiday trip. We called it the five-day trip. Ever since, if we want to refer to it, it's just the five-day trip, because we went off in the car, not knowing where we were going. We just wandered around, decided that we would stay here for a night, and then we would drive on to some other place and say, hey, this looks good, we'll stay here for a night. We found a river where there were soft uh, or smooth shoots down and the water was shooting down through smooth shoots in, in, in the rock. And we said, let's stay here all day and we'll just swim and, and uh, have fun. And he, we had a marvelous time on that five-day trip. And I remember one evening we, we camped beside a, a river in a quiet place right away from the highway. And um, the air was crisp and clear that night. Uh, the sky was brilliant. You know what it's like when you have no humidity in the air and there's no dust? And there, as we looked up, we just talked together about the God who made the universe. It, it, uh, it was so beautiful. I mean, the stars seemed so close as we looked up into the sky that night. And, and we marveled that the God who made those things had the time and interest to care for us on this small planet. You know, I mean, there's a tiny planet in the universe. And to think that God, who has the responsibility, and, you know, he made those things and has the responsibility of, of guiding all those heavenly um, uh, beings, those heavenly objects in their course, that he should have the interest to care for us. And my boy has told me since that it was that night, as we st uh, uh, sat there looking at the sky and talking about these things, that he felt the, the call of God to ministry, you know, to the to ministry of this church. And he followed through on that, and today he's a pastor. He's the youth director of the Greater Sydney Conference. You know, nothing was said that night as we sat there by that river. Nothing was said about ministry. We didn't talk about the possibility that God might touch his heart and, and call him to ministry. Nothing was said about that at all. Um, it was the awareness, an awareness of the majesty of God 
that brought conviction to his mind that night. And it is experiences like these that lead us to address the question, does God speak to us through nature? And if so, what does he say? What does God say? Do we have time? I'm reminded of, of Psalm 19 and verses 1 through 4, where the text says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice, that is the voice of nature, is not heard. In other words, God can speak to people of every language, of every culture, through the wonders of nature. And he has a special message for us. You know, the fact that Scripture... Uh, the fact is that Scripture frequently directs our attention to the wonders of nature, the wonders of God's creative power. The Bible says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. And that text goes on to suggest that you should do it before you get old. You know, before the, the hairs go white like the almond tree, before the legs get weak, the grasshopper, you know, gets weak. Uh, before you become afraid of heights, that which is high, before those which look out of the windows, your eyes become dim or darkened, you know, or the, the, there'll be doors shut in the streets, the little street that leads to your eardrum, and so you become deaf. That's a passage that's talking about people getting old. And it says, remember your Creator before those days come. A bit late when you get too old to begin to think about some of those things, perhaps. Not really too late, but it's better to remember when we're young, isn't it? And all through life, to remember our Creator. We can become so busy with living today. We become urbanized. A lot of us live in cities, and, you know, you see concrete streets and pavements and buildings and glass and cars and smoke and smog. And we don't get the opportunity to see a lot of the wonders of nature. Um, the Bible suggests that we should take time for that. I... Uh, I see the, the beauties and wonders of nature as God's altars. Now, why would I call them altars? Because in, in the book of Joshua, in chapter 4, we read about Joshua saying to the elders in the tribe of Israel, I want the, uh, you to pick one man from each tribe, and as we go through the river Jordan, I want that man to pick up a stone from the, the riverbed of the river Jordan, and carry it through to the other side. And when you get to the other side, I want those 12 men to use those 12 stones and build an altar. And when you've built that altar, we're going to leave it there. And in future, in the years that come down through the years, when our children and our children's children come by and they see this altar, and they say, what mean these stones? What were they to say? Do you remember? They were to say, these stones remind us of God. These stones remind us of God's goodness, of God's blessing to his people Israel, how he brought them out of Egyptian bondage, how he led them through the wilderness safely, provided for them their food and their, their drink and, and their, their warmth at night by a pillar of fire, um, guidance through the pillars of fire and the pillar of cloud. And, and he took them through the River Jordan. And these stones are a reminder of our God. Now, God has many altars in the world of nature, things that are to remind us of God and his mighty power. In Psalm 96, I want to read verse 1 through 4, because here we have another message concerning these wonders of God. And it says here in verse 1, O sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord and bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Now, notice this. Declare his glory among the heathen and his wonders among all the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. You see, it's not enough to remember God's creative work every Sabbath, but he says here we are to declare his wonders among the heathen. What wonders would you declare to the world? I'm sure that with a little thought you could make up a long list. You know, the wise man Solomon listed for us the things that were too wonderful for him. You remember what he said in Proverbs 30, verses 18 and 19? He said, there are three things that are too wonderful for me, yea, four 
which I know not. It's an interesting structure that you get in scripture. You have this one number and then a number, another number. There are three things that are too wonderful for me. In fact, there are four. And then he tells us what they are. The way of an eagle in the air. The way of a serpent on a rock. I don't know what that means. I've, I've got to do some study on that one. What, what is there wonderful about a serpent on a rock? <laughs> My wife thinks it's better if the serpent's under the rock. <laughs> and then uh, a ship on the sea and a man with a maid. Interesting, aren't they? Four things that were too wonderful for Solomon. He couldn't understand all that went on in respect to those things. And there are so many wonders to fascinate us in the world of nature. No wonder the world of nature is spoken of as God's second book. You know, the Bible is his first book, and we, we say that nature is his second book. And we can learn so much about our Heavenly Father through observing the wonders of nature. In Psalm 111, verse 4, it says, He made his wonderful works to be remembered. Now, I have a long list of wonderful things that are too wonderful for me. And I've written some of them down here. I want to share those with you. And that's why I said earlier that this is a, a different kind of presentation today. It may not be as heavy as a deep theological thing, but I want to talk to you about these things because they're important as well. I have a long list of things that are too wonderful for me. Uh, I, uh, I wonder, what is fire? Have you ever sat down and, and thought about that? What really is fire? I don't know. And it's too wonderful for me. How you can strike a match and, and a flame comes up. You put it to dry grass or paper and, and it burns. What is fire? The wonder of sight. You know, if there was no sight, if none of us could see anything at all, would you ever imagine what sight would be? I, I wonder how Helen Keller, who uh, was asked once what she would choose to see if she had three days of sight, how could she understand what they were talking about? Because she had never seen anything in her life. How could you? What is sight? The ability to, to register in your brain what's out there, visually. You know, amazing thing, isn't it? Uh, life locked away in seeds. You know, you, you take a, a little seed, it's, it appears to be dead. You drop that in the soil, the right amount of moisture and warmth and sunlight, and the seed bursts, germinates, comes. Did you know that life can be locked away in seeds for long periods of time and still come back? I have a, an article here that tells me that when the bombs fell on London during World War II, huge craters were blasted by some of those bombs. You know what they're like? Great big craters where the bombs went off and the soil is blasted away and you have a big hole. And it says, months for months afterwards, <coughs> strange flowers begin to, began to bloom in the depths of those craters. <coughs> Bot botanists studying these flowers could not place them in the flora lists that were known today. They were unknown species. And so a search was made in books of bygone times and it is said that as many as 90 different species of plants were growing and blooming in those craters that were totally unknown in the world during World War II. They had been in the world years before, but had become extinct. How long had those seeds stayed down there in the earth, waiting for a bomb to expose them to moisture and light and, you know, and, and warmth? And they germinated. And I read an article one time about the, uh, the ability of seeds to maintain their life for long years. And it uh, spoke of, of some of the tombs in China that were unearthed. And they found in some of those tombs that were 2,000 years old and had been sealed up for 2,000 years, they found lotus seeds in those tombs. And they took those lotus seeds to laboratories and planted them and put the right conditions around them. And they germinated and grew after 2,000 years. I can't understand life locked away in seeds that long. It's one of the mysteries of nature and a wonderful thing about the God who made these things in the first place. How did clouds generate electricity? <laughs> you get a flash of lightning. How does that happen? I don't know. Too wonderful for me. 
How is it that we can see through solid stuff like glass? Here it is, I'm standing here and I can see my shoes through this glass. How is it that you can see through solid stuff? And you can, you can see clearly on the other side. I found out how treacherous that could be when I ran through a glass door once. I didn't know it was there because I could see right through it. I ran right into it and got torn. My flesh and my clothes got torn by the breaking glass. But uh, the ability to... How do hummingbirds beat their wings 60 times every second? And if you think that's a bit fast, what about flies who beat their wings 300 times per second? Now that, that is just too wonderful for me. Wonders of nature. You know, when we lived in America, there were little animals that lived in our backyard. We had uh, woods. They don't call it bush in America, you know. They don't know what bush is, except it's the name of their president. Um, but, but what we call the bush here in Australia and New Zealand, they call it the woods. And we had a big patch, big stretch of woods behind our house, and living in those woods were squirrels. And there was a beautiful little animals, you know, little grey squirrels with their little fluffy tail, and they'd come and sit up and pick up a, 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 an acorn and sit there munching on this acorn. But sometimes they didn't eat the, the things they picked up. The seeds that they got from underneath the bird feeder, the peanuts we threw out to them, sometimes uh, you know, little chocolate lollies and things. They loved those. And, and I would watch these, and they would take them in their mouth and then run across the lawn, until they came to a place that seemed suitable and with their little feet they would pull the grass apart like this and then they'd poke their, their nose with the, the food in it down into the hole and deposit the, the nut or the lolly, whatever it was, down in there and then when they'd finished pushing it with their head, bumping it down so it was pressed right in, they would then sit back and with their feet they'd pull the grass back like this so that it covered up completely and you wouldn't know that anybody had disturbed the grass at that point. And they would bury things like this all over the, the yard. So that when the winter time came and there were no more acorns and, and um, if we were away and they didn't send them out little nuts and, and bird seed and stuff, they'd go around the lawn sniffing and, until they could sniff this. And then they'd dig and up with the, the food and they provided for their future. Now we also had little things there called, um, um, what are they called? Chipmunks. Little striped animals about this, the body about this long. See, A little tail on them. Beautiful little creatures they were too. And I remember seeing the chipmunks um, when I put up a, a cob of corn, dry corn, on, on the tree for the, uh, the, the woodpeckers and other birds. Uh, I saw the, the chipmunks going up the tree trunk to that cob and biting off the kernels and stuffing them in, in their cheeks until their cheeks bulged out. You know, now whenever I took too much stuff like that, my mother said, don't be greedy. But the chipmunks were greedy and they would fill their cheeks until they bulged right out and they couldn't get any more kernels in there and then they would come down the tree and, and run and down underneath the path and deposit them and then go back and get more until they had a whole store of the stuff and then I wouldn't see the chipmunks for three months they didn't need to come out anymore they had three months supply of food there and I was weeding in my rose garden one day and I found a little patch of sunflower plants growing, about eight or nine of them in an area about this big. And I thought, well, I didn't plant sunflower seeds here. I feed them to the birds. But here they were growing in my rose garden. And I thought, now something must have planted these. And so I looked around and I found 33 little gardens of sunflowers that had been planted by the chipmunks. Now, how did they know that if they planted those seeds, they'd grow, and next season they'd be able to get seed from the, the flower heads themselves? These are wonders, you know, of nature that remind us of a creator God who has placed into the minds of those little creatures the ability to know what they need to do. And so they do these things by natural. Have you ever tried to build a bird's nest? Oh, I lived in Hamilton here in New Zealand for years, and I used to go along the bird, the, the, along the, uh, the hedgerows looking for birds' nests. I loved to find the birds' nests and watch the, the parents feed the little babies. And I tried to build a bird's nest. And believe me, it's more difficult than you might think. I watched the weaver birds in Africa weaving the, the grass in and out and in and out, just like the threads in a, a piece of cloth, until they, they wove beautiful bundles of, of, of uh, 
of straw into such a, a magnificent fashion that they were tough and, and, and secure for rearing their, their little ones. Uh, the, there's a, a little bird in South America that has fascinated me. Um, these little birds don't build a nest out of straw like that but rather they build a nest in, in a solid granite rock. Um, they, they dig a, a burrow two or three feet long in solid granite rock, just big enough for them to go down, and at the end they hollow it out into a bigger chamber, and down there they carry a little bit of straw and some fluffy stuff and feathers, and they make a warm little nest down inside the, the burrow at the end of a, a tunnel in solid granite rock. Now how does a bird with a beak, no stronger than the fingernail material, on your, your fingers, dig a hole in granite rock. But they do it. And do you know what they do? In the forests where they live, there is a certain type of bush. And the birds will, will select a, a suitable granite rock first, and then they fly off into the, the, the bush, and they will pick a leaf. Each bird will pick a leaf from this bush, and they'll bring it and put it on the rock, and then they'll pick, crushing the leaf in a circle and filling in the circle. So the whole area within that circle has been crushed against the rock and there's an acid in the leaf and the acid dissolves the granite rock. And they will continue this process hundreds of times with leaf after leaf after leaf gradually dissolving the rock until they have dissolved a burrow two or three feet long and a chamber at the end of it for their nest. Isn't that astonishing? Who taught these birds? That, uh, that acid would dissolve granite rock. And who taught them that, that that particular bush has acid in its leaves? Astonishing things. No wonder God said that we should give attention to the wonders of nature because these things reveal to us the, the, the intelligence, the wisdom and the mighty power of God and the goodness of God in providing such wonderful things in our world. Did you know why it is that little birds are able to break their way out of eggs when they hatch? Do you know that what happens is this, that inside every egg there's a little sack of, of air, a tiny little sack of air inside the, the egg. That's, that's, uh, when the egg is formed, the, the air is trapped inside. And when the little birds inside have developed to the point where they're almost ready to, to uh, hatch, they begin to breathe that air that's inside the, the shell. And as they begin to breathe that air, they become dependent on breathing. You know, it's like a baby. I mean, a human baby when it's born. Before it starts to breathe, it doesn't need to breathe. But once it starts to breathe, it needs to keep breathing, doesn't it? And so these little birds, once they start breathing that air, they need to keep on breathing. But the air supply runs out. And you try and see what happens when the air supply runs out and you stop breathing. I mean, if you don't believe me, you hold your nose and keep your mouth shut for 10 minutes and see what happens. The body becomes stressed, doesn't it? If you keep it long enough and, and, and persist, you begin to, to jerk yourself around and you struggle because your body needs oxygen. And you're, you're, you're struggling through oxygen de deprivation. And that's what happens to the little birds. They need oxygen and they're struggling because they need more and there is no more inside the egg and it's their struggling that causes the little piece on top of their beak to break the shell. And they're able to hatch and breathe, take a big gasp of air and hatch. Scientists have discovered these things. I, I think of the intelligence of the creatures of nature. You know, um, we could tell many stories about that. I think of the crows that... Uh, uh, one of our doctors told us about it at the uh, Faith and Science Council at Avondale some months ago. Dr. Tar Burton told us about these crows in a certain country that, that have intelligence. And uh, he said uh, they live in the city and there are, there are street lights, you know, that, uh, that turn red when, you, when the pedestrians are not supposed to cross, so you have a red light. And, uh, and so people line up ready to cross until it turns green. When it turns green, then they cross the road. Well, these crows line up with, with the pedestrians. And they wait until the light turns green, and then they march out into the middle of the road, each carrying a walnut. And they put the walnut down on the road, and then they back, go, go back to where they were, on the sidewalk, on the footpath. And they wait there until the light turns red, 
and now it turns green for the, tr the cars, see? And so the cars come through now and run over their walnuts and, and crack the walnuts. And, when they, and, and they wait then until the light for the pedestrians turns green and then they walk out onto the road and they pick up the, the, the pieces of walnut from the cracked walnuts. And if there are nuts that were missed by the car tyres, they'll pick them up and shift them about six inches and then back down to the footpath again and wait for the next uh, sequence of cars to cross. And Dr. Tarburton was telling us that, uh, you know, evolutionists say that, uh, that uh, monkeys, certain forms of the monkey species and human beings are descended from a common ancestor because we both use tools. Monkeys will use little sticks to poke into, um, into uh, uh, termites' nests and they pull the sticks out covered with termites and then eat the termites off them, see? And because they use these tools to get the termites out and because humans use tools, then we're both descended from a common ancestor. But he said it's very interesting that nobody has ever suggested that crows and human beings have a common ancestor, even though crows have uh, the same kind of, or better perhaps, intelligence than some animals. Wonderful, isn't it? I think of a lyre bird that, um, that I went to hear. There was a, a man who had, well, let me tell you first, yes. There, there, there's this man who lived in the escarpment up at a place called Dorigo in New South Wales. Now that's where you come from the coastal plain to the escarpment. You go up the escarpment by a winding road and there's rainforest. You get up on top and there's a little town called Dorigo up there. And not far from Dorigo, there's a rainforest where one of the rangers, the uh, government rangers, uh, wildlife and, and uh, fisheries men, by the name of Neville Fenton, an Adventist, took me one time into the forests. We went through private property drove through where he was allowed to go. We got into this, into this rainforest at the top of the escarpment uh, in a winter's morning when lyrebirds start to, to uh, do their, their courting displays. And at that time, of course, they sing a lot. They have their mounds and they get on those mounds and they, they copy all the birds in the forest. I don't know if it, some of you have heard lyrebirds, but they're amazing creatures. They bring their tail <laughs> over the, and they have it in front of them and they display like this with their, their tail feathers shaking and you can hear the clatter of the, of the, the feathers together. A beautiful uh, display and the whole time they're singing and they're copying the birds of the forest and I have tape recordings of them copying 14 different birds. You know, the, the parrots and the, all the other kind of birds, the whipbirds and the uh, currawongs and so on, magpies. Kookaburras, they can laugh like, uh, one, one lyrebird can laugh like three kookaburras that are laughing at the same time you know, all together. And, uh, and they can copy all kinds of sounds. They can copy the sounds of, of uh, woodsmen with, with saws, chainsaws, trains going through, you know. They do it, all of it. Babies crying. People have stopped and gone into the forest looking for the abandoned baby, only to find it was a lyre bird copying baby crying. Uh, they're amazing birds. Well, in this place where we went in the forest, there had been a man who lived there near the, the, the uh, escarpment about 60 or 70 years ago. And uh, this man used to play a flute. And when people would come to visit him in his home, they would hear a flute playing and they would say, hey, we didn't know anyone else in your family played a flute. And he said, no, they don't. Well, what's that we hear? Well, that's my bird. That's my lyre bird. And he had a lyre bird that ran with his fowls in a fowl run outside. It was like a tame bird. And it had heard him playing the flute up and down the scales and some of the little flighty bits. And it, it copied them with the same tone as a flute, everything, perfectly. Well, the time came when this man chose to leave the district and go to a, an area that was much drier and hotter weather. It's not good for lyrebirds there. So he decided to let out his pet lyrebird into the rainforest, and he did 70 years ago. And when Neville Fenton took me into that forest, uh, it was after 55, 60 years when I went into the forest, I was astonished because I heard a flute start up over here. And then I heard another one start up over here. And then another one. And I heard, heard a whole orchestra of flutes in that rainforest because that first lyrebird had continued to play the flute when he was released into the forest. And the other lyrebirds heard him and they copied him. And then their offspring heard them and they copied them. And, and so down through the years they have passed on 
the ability to play the flute to the whole community of lyrebirds in that rainforest. Wonderful, beautiful sound. And I was astonished by it. Now we could talk a long time about that sort of thing. I think a pop grazed parrot. Maybe I, I don't know if I've got time for that. We're just about running out of time, aren't we? Well, you're still here. Yes, okay. Pop, you know, Pop Gray lived in Albury, New South Wales, and uh, his daughter was at college with us. I remember when we went to work in Albury in evangelistic work, that we'd visit Pop Gray, and he had one of these sulphur-crested white cockatoos, you know, the big fellows, and this one had pulled all its feathers out. Now, that's a disease they get, and they'll, uh, it, they just pluck themselves until they've, they've plucked all the feathers that they can reach. And so they've got feathers on their head, but none on their body. And uh, he was a naked bird, would sit up there in the, in, the, uh, in the cage. And when I was visiting there one time, Pop Gray wasn't home. I knocked on the door a couple of times and nobody came out. And then I heard this push, 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 push. And I looked and here was this parrot calling up all the cats. Now Pop Gray had about 25 cats. And they came running out of all the wood heap and all the other places where cats go. And they call, came running with their tails in the air right up to Pop Gray's parrot's cage and surrounded it thinking they were about to be given a feed. And when they were all there, the, the parrot stopped calling and went <laughs> And you should have seen the cats. They ran for their lives. They ran for the wood heap and behind the shed wherever they could get away and hide. And that parrot threw its head back and laughed. Oh! <laughs> Just like the old man would have laughed. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Well, there's one more story I want to tell you, and that's about the monarch butterflies. I had the privilege uh, a few years, well, maybe it's yeah, about two years ago, I went down into uh, uh, me uh, Mexico, yeah, uh, to a place called Guadalajara. Oh, they don't sound the J, so it's Guadal Guadalajara, uh, to a place called El Rosario. Now, at this place, during the Northern Hemisphere's winter, the uh, monarch butterflies, we sometimes call them wanderer butterflies, the monarch butterflies gather from North America and they fly down and they winter in the mountains there at El Rosario. They say that there are about 13 million butterflies per hectare. And I have to tell you that it was an amazing sight. When these butterflies arrive there, the sky is absolutely darkened by the flocks of butterflies coming in for seven or eight days as they fly in great drifts into these mountains and they gather on the trees and they hang under the, on the foliage. They, they cover the trunks so you can't see a portion of bark on the tree trunks. They're just everywhere. Millions and millions of butterflies that gather there. The amazing thing is this that when it comes to springtime in the northern hemisphere, these butterflies fly north again. They fly back into, north, in, into the United States and they lay their eggs and then die. And the babies hatch from those eggs and they feed and, uh, as caterpillars and then they pupate, the chrysalis form. Then they hatch out as butterflies and they fly further north and they mate and lay their eggs and they die. And when those young ones hatch, they repeat this process all through summer until it comes autumn time. And when the autumn time comes round, all the butterflies from the eastern and central states of the United States congregate together on the coasts of Texas. And you've got the great Gulf of Texas there, you know, the water that separates there south of, of Texas. Uh, and, you know, Florida and Texas, there's a tremendous amount of water down there. Of course, the land... Uh, of Mexico is joined over on the western side, but not on the east. And so you've got all this water now separating these butterflies from Mexico. And they gather there in their millions, billions in fact, until uh, they're just like the children of Israel, ready to do an exodus from Egypt, see. And they wait together until the, the conditions are right and there are enough of them, and then they launch out and they pour into the sky billions of butterflies over the ocean. Do you know it took me more than two hours to fly across that ocean in an aeroplane? And here are these little butterflies now flying out across this ocean. How do they know where to go? For they've never traveled this way before. 
These are the offspring, see, that, that were hatched and grew up in, in the United States. And now they're heading out on a journey they've never made before for uh, over, over the ocean, which took more than two hours in an aeroplane to cross. How do they succeed with such fragile bodies and, and wings to fly across that great ocean and, and to the place where every year they congregate to winter? Just a small area in the mountains, and there they are. It's too wonderful for me, far too wonderful for me. But obviously there's a creator God who looks after these things. And the question could well be asked then, why does God direct our attention to the wonders of nature? What does he want us to learn? And to answer that question, I'd like to direct your attention to the book of Job, because we have an answer in scripture. Here in the book of Job, uh, we, uh, we find the story of a man who endured unspeakable hardships. You remember the story of Job, how he lost his possessions, he lost his children, they were all killed one way or another. He lost his health and re was reduced to boils from head to foot. He sat in sackcloth and ashes and, and scratched his, his, his boils. He, he was in agony. He, he lost the support of his friends because they came in and accused him of sinful life and that's why God was punishing him, they said. And then to top it all, he lost the support of his wife who said to him, why don't you curse God and die? You know, I, uh, I, I've often thought about the story of Job. Nothing was going right. No wonder he asked the question, why? His life was shattered. And so he challenged God. He wanted vindication. He wanted God to, to uh, rise up in his defense, uh, especially in the face of the criticisms that he was enduring from his friends, his so-called friends. He wanted vindication. But instead, um, you, have you noticed that God did not vindicate Job? In, in all the book of Job, you will not find anywhere that God vindicated Job. Instead, he said to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if you've got understanding, where were you? Now, that's, that's something, isn't it? You see, the commentary tells us that God's purpose was not to settle an argument between Job and his comforters. It was rather to reveal himself. And he achieved that by directing Job's attention to the wonders of nature. I, I'd like you to turn to Job chapter 38, <clears throat> because here we have the record of what God had to say to Job. Job chapter 38, verse 4, is where he asked the question, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have, have understanding. Who has laid the foundations thereof? If thou knowest... And who stretched the line upon it? And then God asked Job questions about many of the, the features and the wonders of nature. Notice verse 8. Who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth? In other words, why doesn't the sea overflow the, the land? Who is it that has created gravity that keeps the sea in the lower portions of the earth? That's the question. See. Who is it that's responsible for this? You go on down through here. Go to verse 12. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place? <clears throat> In verse 19, where is the way where light dwelleth? And, and as for darkness, where is the place thereof? What's the difference between light and darkness? Can you explain it? That's his question. Verse 22, hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? Verse 25, who hath divided a watercourse for the overflowing of waters, that is the floods, or a way for the lightning of thunder to cause it to rain on the earth. Have you ever noticed that when a thunderstorm is coming, you see the lightning and then the rain starts? It's always after the lightning that you get the best rain. Here he's asking Job, do you understand that? Do you know what's behind the, the way the lightning and the thunder <clears throat> and the rain affect our lives? And notice verse 28, he, he asks about the drops of dew. And 29 and out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven. You know, when I lived in America, I remember in Washington one day, 
uh, we had what they call a, a freezing rain storm. <coughs> now, freezing rain is when rain falls, but everything it touches, so cold that everything it touches, it freezes on immediately. And so as the rain fell, it, it began to freeze around the twigs and the branches and the stems on all the trees. Now, the trees, of course, mostly deciduous in the, in the woods, and so here are all these bare trees now with ice forming around them, all the branches. And there's ice, you know, up to an inch thick, finally, has formed all around all the branches the, uh, and the twigs until the, the whole forest is encased in ice. And the next day, the sun came up in a perfectly clear blue sky. There wasn't a cloud in the sky and the temperature never went above freezing all day. And so none of this ice melted. And I have to tell you, friends, that that forest looked like a crystal forest. It was absolutely beautiful with the, the bright sun shining through all the ice that had gathered on the branches. Wonderful thing. And when the, the breeze came up a little bit, you could hear the clinking, the, the clinking, twinkling like, like little bells as the, as the ice touched against each other and sometimes cracked a little bit. You hear little cracking sounds. And when the, the evening came and the sun began to set and caused a red glow in the sky, all this ice turned pink. <laughs> it was magic. And here Job is asked the question by God, do you know the, the mysteries of ice and frost? In verse 31, he asks about the, the heavenly bodies, the stars, and then he goes on to the creatures of the earth. In verse 39, the lion. Verse 41, a raven. The next chapter, wild goats and calves. He, you go on down through that chapter to verse 13, and he asks about the, the wings of the peacock, the feathers of the peacock and how they shine. Verse 19, the horse. Verse 26, the hawk. Does it fly by your wisdom? Verse 27, doth the eagle mount up at the, thy command and make her nest on high? These are the questions that were being thrown at Job when Job was looking for vindication from God. And if you've noticed as we've gone through this, God said nothing here that would vindicate Job. God made no reference in all of these verses here as to why the righteous suffer. Nothing about the future world or the rewards one might expect from present inequalities. Nothing at all. God simply revealed himself through the wonders of nature. And he intended that this revelation should be sufficient to answer Job's question and his problems. And it was enough. Have you noticed Job's reply? It's found in chapter 42 and verse 5. And Job says, I have heard thee by the hearing of my ear, now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I, I, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. See, it was enough. Job had a picture of God whose greatness was manifested to him in dramatic ways through the world of nature. And it was enough to help Job to understand, to realize, to accept that God is in control. And if God is in control, then everything's all right. We have nothing to fear. You know, it, 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 he accepted his lot in life in the spirit of Paul's testimony. Where the apostle Paul said that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So you see where I've been going with all of this? I've told a lot of stories this morning, but the purpose is to, to refresh your mind with the fact that God is the master artist and the master designer. And the loveliness of the work, of his work in nature, is a reflection of the loveliness of the work that he longs to accomplish in our lives. You see, nature opens the path. It takes away the selfishness and the evil, the introspection that's so common and inspires in us the good and the pure and the lovely. It washes us clean if we understand whose hand it all came from. As Job discovered, you cannot look deeply into the heart of a flower without being influenced for the better. Our minds are elevated above the common, the ordinary things because in that magic moment, the disagreeable, the sordid and the defiling things 
are all forgotten. There's a reason for that. It's because we meet God there. We discover his power, his wisdom, and his love. We discover all over again that he is in, in control and that all is well. After all, he is our heavenly father. We are his children. We're part of God's family. And families stick together. That's the way it is. I want to read in closing a statement from the pen of Ellen White. And she makes this statement in the little book, uh, Steps to Christ, where she says, God is love is written on every opening bud, upon every spire of springing grass, the lovely birds making the air vocal with their happy songs, the delicately tinted flowers in their perfection perfuming the air, the lofty trees of the forest with their rich foliage of living green, all testify to the tender fatherly care of our God and to his desire to make his children happy. There's healing and peace, there's hope, and there's joy in these glimpses of God. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we, we just want to say thank you that you have filled this world, world with so many wonderful things. The world of nature is so beautiful. And uh, as we reflect upon them, as we take time out, as it were, to acknowledge your goodness, your mighty power. Our own hearts are inspired and encouraged because we know that the God who made these things is control of, in control of our lives too. And he only wishes our best good. Thank you, Lord. And please bless us that we might ever remember this. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Is there? Well, after yesterday morning, I don't think we're stranger anymore. <laughs> okay. So, um, do we call you elder? Um, well, in America, they call pastors elder. Yeah. Is in, that because you know, they're older, and, are they? And, and any, no, no, just any minister in America, any minister, whether it's a lady or a man, is called pastor. You know, they are pastors. And so, uh, it's a little confusing, you know, it the is, world yeah. church, because, you, you know, the church doesn't yet ordain ladies as pastors. Um, and, and yet in America, the women ministers are called pastor. And so when you have people from Africa and Australia and other places come there and hear a woman being called pastor in our church, they think that America has gone ahead of, of the church's decisions, you see. Yes. But in America, a person is, is called elder once they're ordained. So I'm elder Tolhurst in America, see. Now, they never call me pastor. It's always elder. Okay. Yeah. So... Um being an elder, then you'll have, you'd have some grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Oh, yeah. See, I'm one day older than the general conference president, so he has to call me elder too. <laughs> okay. So you come back home to pasture or uh, yes, to pastor? To pasture. Pasture. <laughs> U-R-E. Pasture. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm retired. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you back in the South Pacific Division. And uh, Pastor Tolhurst came out to Kiribati a couple of times and... Before he really retires, he might like to come out again to help us out there. But uh, let's, uh, Pastor Toller, so Elder, let's sing the last song together as we stand. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. <laughs>